Okay, I just want to read you scripture. Let's look at the top four outlines just for a second. We're continuing on uh, with our spiritual warfare series. And we are specifically taking a very close look at the full armor of God, the whole armor of God. Because I'm absolutely convinced that a lot of Christians can quote that, but very few know what it means historically and certainly don't know the application of why Paul wrote what he wrote and what that should mean for us as believers here in the 21st century. So that's why we're taking our time examining this stuff. All right, so let's look real quick. Paul said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He said, put on the whole armor of God. You notice that the Holy Spirit is not going to put it on you. Hello? Number one, the Holy Spirit won't put it on you. You've got to put it on. Secondly, just because you're born again doesn't mean you have it. It means it's available to you. There's a whole lot of Christians that are Christian clueless. They can quote a couple scriptures, but man, they don't know what it means to move in the Spirit. They don't know what it means to live in the Spirit. They don't know what it means to pray in the Spirit. They don't know how to use God's Word. They don't know how to quote God's Word. They don't know how to pray God's Word. But they own a big Bible. So I'll give them credit for that. But it's got to take a whole lot more than that. Are you with me this morning? It's going to just take a whole lot more than that. Because the devil doesn't fear the fact that you own a Bible. He fears the fact that you know it. Because that's like saying, you know, I got the greatest gun collection this side. Well, do you know how to shoot? Absolutely not. I couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. Boy, that's going to really ward off intruders. Now, he said, put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles, the plans, the wickedness, the strategies of the devil. You know one of the things the devil uses is discouragement, depression, and disillusionment. You know that? He doesn't have to use sin. He doesn't have to use drugs. He doesn't have to use pornography. He uses things wherever there's an opening in our emotions. That is a strategy that probably paralyzes emotionally most Christians when they're not aware of what's going on there. Say, well, I'm really depressed today. Well, why? I have no idea. Watch out. Now, if it's an event, something that's happened to you, at least you can put your finger on what the source of it is. But when you start to get into this disillusion mode, you know, you can really get in trouble. Because you can start thinking you're Elijah. Remember, Elijah was under that tree. He just, you know, slew hundreds of false prophets of Baal. Declared the word of the Lord and the rain stopped in Israel. And just because a woman puts out a contract on him, he goes into complete death spiral. And he finds himself sitting under a tree. And this is what he actually believed. I'm the only one left. I'm the only one serving you. I'm the only one, I'm the only one left. And the Lord rebuked him soundly. He said, who do you think you are? You think I'm that powerless that I'm depending on you? got news for you, pal. I got 7,000 more just in the city to have him bow the knee to the devil. And that's, see, the point is this. You know, Elijah wasn't a fool. Elijah wasn't, Elijah was just like you and I. Okay, he wasn't Superman. He didn't go into a phone booth and come out with that shirt. He was just like you and I, and he was used mightily by God. But once, listen, you cannot live out of your giftedness because your giftedness will stop. Who you really are is who you are when your gift is not in operation. I want to say that again. Who you really are is who you are when your gift is not functioning. If you live primarily out of your giftedness for a long period of time, you'll forget how to be a normal person. It's like somebody who's a prophet. Someone who's a prophet, I can, when I get with them, because we've known many prophets over the years, 
and many, I'd say three quarters of the prophetic ministries that we've had over the years and years and years, forgot what it was like to be a normal person. Because seven days a week or six days a week, they're going from city to city to city to city, church to church to church to church, every week, <coughs> excuse me, every weekend, different state, different church. And guess what? <clears throat> Along the way, they, usually, they forgot what it was like to be a person. So everything, the whole world revolved around prophecy. The whole world revived, revolved around, listen, meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. Now what would happen if the meeting stopped? Boy, they need therapy because they lost, they lost sight of who they were. Their gift and their ministry is not who they are, it's what they do. And so we, we talked to several of them over the years trying to draw them back in. That's not you. That's what God called you to do. That's not who you are. Who we are as Christians. Who we are is supposed to be growing emotionally, spiritually, naturally, etc. We're supposed to be well-balanced individuals that are growing on and going onward. That's what you do. If you stay on that, man, you're going to just derail. That's why Hollywood's so messed up. These people play roles for so long, they don't even know who they are. They're just a, a flat-out mess. One more messed up than the other. And they're odd. Some of them are strange. <laughs> or do you think they're well-balanced, well-adjusted individuals? Oh, please. Now, Paul said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. There are things unseen. There are forces beyond us that we are wrestling with. And against these things are called principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of a particular age. And against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly or the high places, as Paul said. Is it? You do all right in here temperature-wise? Wow. Man, that sounded like a session of Congress. <laughs> yes, no, hot, warm, I, I, yeah, well, yeah, okay, good, good. See you next year in the next session. Now, I want to just share this with you because I want to give you a real life snapshot of principalities and powers in action. And I want to just read this scripture to you, Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 11. <coughs> and Isaiah gives the recollection this way. He said, For the Lord spoke this way to me with a strong hand, and he instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, and I want you to just for the sake of time jump down to verse 19. All right, because he's telling Isaiah that the nation of Israel has completely derailed spiritually. They're off the, they're off the wall. They don't want to obey me anymore. So they raise up false prophets that tell them what they want to hear. And I believe we got some preachers nowadays that are just telling people anything they want to hear just to get their church to grow. And it's a tremendous disservice. Disservice to tell people that stuff. Verse 19 says, And when they say to you, Seek those who are mediums and wizards. And you can say psychics, psychic networks. Tarot card reading, you can fill in the blanks with any kind of counterfeit spiritual activity. He said, seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter. Should not a people seek their God instead? So what the Lord was saying, watch out, Isaiah. They're going to start to tell you that your word is not, no longer relevant. You know, you're an old man, get you out of the way. People don't want to hear your stuff anymore because it's too hard. It, it costs too much. And they're going to start to seek out false prophets and spirits of divination and witchcraft to tell them what they want to hear. They're going to be healthy, wealthy, wise, and rich. And it won't cost them anything to follow the Lord. Just do this. And then I, and the Lord says to Isaiah, but instead of all that nonsense, should not people that are called God's people be seeking their God? Now listen to this last sentence in verse 19. 
Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? Verse 20, he said to the law and to the testimony, that's a shout saying, go back to God's word. If they do not speak according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. We got into our entire denominations that are demonic now. Departed from God's word. Ichabod written over the door. They use Bible. They might use a Bible in the service, but they have a spirit of error. They are not reading it and preaching it the way it's written. Peter said they are distorting it and twisting it to their own destruction. They're like wandering stars. He said, if they do not speak according to my word, it's because there's no light in them. Remember, it echoes what Jesus said in Matthew 7, oh, uh, many, many years after that. You'll know every tree by its fruit. If somebody tells me so-and-so is a great preacher, I just want to hear what they preach. See, it's one thing to be a great communicator. That's a stylistic thing. Right? That could be vocal training and oratorial training. But I want to hear what they're preaching. Third, I want to hear the spirit in which it's being preached. That's why when somebody, oh, did you hear this so-and-so guy? I said, no, why? Is he on YouTube? Is he on some other place? Yeah. Okay, and I'll check him out. I'm not looking to be critical. I'm not this guy's judge or this woman's judge. But I know a false spirit when it's there. Somebody a few years back, three or four years ago, was trying to get us to have this particular guy. Um, he was in New England and New York region. And this guy was some hot stuff. Oh, you got to have this guy. You got to have this guy. You got to have this guy. I said, we're not feeling it. We're not feeling it. I can't believe it. He, you know, I tried to broker this deal. He already said he'd come. He's prophetic. He's this and that and the other thing. And I said, no, 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 no. So then I heard a little snippet of, some stuff that he was preaching somewhere or another, and I said, now I know why we don't want him. So this guy that was trying to broker this deal kind of got angry with me, dismissed me. And now this guy is branded as a false prophet throughout the body of Christ. Preaching crazy stuff now. And luring in unsuspecting Christians because it sounds spiritual. But let me tell you, it's not rooted in the scripture. It's all experientially based. It's got to be rooted in scripture, guys. Got to be rooted in the word or you'll get sucked in and taken away. And so much stuff sounds spiritual. But you can't go by that stuff. You've got to know what spirit it's of. Okay, so anyhow, this is what Isaiah is dealing with in his day. <clears throat> and look what he goes on to verse, verse 21 and says, They will pass through it hard-pressed and hungry, and it shall happen when they're hungry that they will be enraged and they will curse their king and their God. In other words, I'm going to bring a curse on the land because from the king down, they've departed from me. <clears throat> Boy, that sounds like America. <clears throat> That's certainly where we're going. Certainly where we're going. When you've got rainbow colored lights lighting up the White House, the most powerful place on planet Earth, we are in official trouble. It's not lit up in red, white, and blue for our veterans that are losing their lives around the world. But get the rainbow stuff, got to have it. I got to tell you, that's devilish. I don't care if it was a Republican, Democrat, I don't care who it is. That's devilish. Because all I'm interested in one thing right here. We got to be interested in one thing, guys. What does God have to say? Because when this all comes down, we better hold fast to God's word because they're going to be shaking and rocking and rolling. Verse 22. He says that when things start to come unglued in that nation, they will look to the earth and then they will see trouble and darkness and gloom of anguish and they will be driven into darkness. So I want to tell you, <clears throat> these principalities and powers are at work. I want to share this real account that I've excerpted out of a particular book. Uh, it was a guy <clears throat> that went to 
Congo to be a missionary some years back. And it, not the Democratic Republic of Congo, but the nation of Congo. There's two Congos. We minister in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but this is when the, the nation that runs right alongside of it. And there was a guy named Mungiri, <clears throat> and he was a friend of the missionary, and this guy had been led to Christ, this Mungiri guy. Now this guy got married, he's serving in church, he had a wife and two daughters, but he had no son. He was the director of a boy's home, so there was a Christian home, and there was filled with young boys that were trying to get, you know, a start in life and get instruction from God's word and then life skills training. And this guy was a director. But he had no son. He was the best hunter of birds. And, and this guy was an experienced hunter from birth in this mission area. He was an elder in his church, admired and trusted throughout the region as a Christian leader. But he was not happy, you know why? Because he had no son. He had two daughters. And so the missionary recounts it this way. Although he was one of my first and best friends among Africa's Maluba people, and although we worked, talked, hunted, prayed, studied God's word together, I did not realize how deeply this guy was burdened and how heavy the pressures were from pagan, demonic, demonized relatives over his failure to father a male offspring. Nor did I know at that time why a son was so necessary in that tribal order of thinking. Therefore, I was quite shocked when the pastor announced during the morning prayer on a Sunday morning that Mungidi had left the Lord, returned to his village, his native village, and gone back to his old pagan demon ways from which he'd been delivered. I could not believe what I was hearing. I thought I knew my friend. I thought we communicated on deep and meaningful levels and shared everything openly with each other. But it was true. The tribal demonic pressure for a son had forced him to leave his Christian wife, who had given him only daughters, and return to the village of his father, taking on two younger women as surrogate wives with the hope that one of them would bear him a son. Why are sons so necessary, I asked the pastor. He said, because in tribal culture, daughters marry and then they go with their husbands to the village of the husband's parents. Children all belong to their father. I'm sorry. Children all belong to the father in our culture, not the wife. Only sons remain in the village where they're born because the daughters marry and they go to where the husband, their husbands live. Only sons remain in the village and only sons, therefore, now here's where it gets really weird. Only sons, therefore, can feed the ancestral spirits and appease these spirits. If one does not show respect for, and it's an African term, but I'll just say the dead ancestors, they will become angry and even uh, physically afflict and spiritually afflict and emotionally afflict the careless and ungrateful son that does not appease these spirits. Furthermore, when a tribesman dies, he must leave a son to care for his spirit, which remains in the village, according to our customs, as an unseen spirit member of the tribe. So then the missionary asked the pastor, he said, so then Mangidi has given himself to trust the tribal ways more than the teaching of God's word, the new tribe, as they call it there, isn't he? Yes, the pastor replied, he has rejected the word of God, which warns against communicating with spirits of the dead. He has gone back to this old way and is now caught in its web of darkness and totally deceived. I was determined, the missionary said, to bring my friend back, so I traveled to his village some five kilometers away. When I found him, I was shocked, and even in the change of his countenance and his appearance, and this is very frequently the case, his once radiant face that glowed with the glory of God was now dark with the utter darkness that marks people under dem demonic direction and control. It was obvious that he had been sp talking and communicating and communing with spirits and seeking their power in his life. But I had a problem. I did not believe that evil spirits could take over a life that had been transformed by faith in Christ. So I was conflicted. From a theological standpoint, it seemed impossible for a born-again believer to go back to his former slavery, but it looked like that's just what happened to my friend. 
So he goes hunting with this guy. He said, for old time's sake, let's go hunting again. And when they come back, we return to his house to rest while his two wives prepared the hens and all the birds that we caught for the meal. Looking around the area outside of his house, I was impressed with the fact that he had settled in the very center of spirit worship for his whole tribe. Or in other words, there was the pagan shrine right there. A medicine man sat nearby along with three other medicine women in the robes they wore when they communicate with demon spirits. Their drums were there, as were the rattles, the charms, and the spirit mound. It was like a little, little hill that they would stand on. The mound, to me, looked like a good pulpit that I could use and hijack. So I asked Mungidi to get on the tribal drums and beat the sound. Get, and they have a particular progression that tells people, come and gather. He said, I want to preach God's word. He said, you want to try and do that here? This is the devil's territory, you know. And he said, ah, I can talk with God any place, Mungidi, anytime I want. Don't you know that? Get the people here. And Mungidi said, well, we'll see about that. I'll get him here. A large crowd gathered around this spirit mound. I was surprised to see that the medicine man and his, and his women were amused. They were intrigued. And it was always nice, I thought, to have people that were hungry. Especially when they're otherwise capable of being very dangerous. When I stood to speak, however, and listen to this, I felt the absolutely oppressive presence and power of overwhelming evil, evil grip me from head to toe. To toe. This utter darkness was literally suffocating me physically. It was like an icy cold hand, he writes, gripped me around the throat, and I felt myself almost gagging uncontrollably. The cold fingers of death pressed my throat. I could not even utter one word. As I stood there in foolish helplessness, the medicine people laughed, and it really sounded so demonic like voices from hell. I turned in utter defeat to sit down with Mogidi. I said, I can't speak here. He said, you should have known better. This entire region has been dedicated to Satan. You have no right or power here to do what you're trying to do. So I asked him, does God have any turf in this village? He said, yes. On the other side of the village, we used to have a little Christian chapel that's been long since torn down. The building is gone but according to our spirit customs, the piece of land stays always dedicated to the one to whom it belonged for a period of time. He said, okay, invite people to come over to that place. He said, so we went to this place, and it was just a ditch now. Um, I think he said 10 feet wide and 30 feet long where this little chapel had been. He said, I walked into this ditch to where I suppose the pulpit might have been at one point in time. Um, and people started gathering all in this ditch. He said, in the seven years that I had lived with those people, I had never preached with liberty in the Spirit of God like I did that day. The words flowed with power, clarity, beauty, and demonstration of the Holy Spirit like never before. The people who stood only in that ditch were electrified with a power from heaven, and their response was immediate and unanimous. They said, we will rebuild God's house. And by evening of the next day, a new chapel was erected with a thatched roof. A new house for a teacher and a preacher was constructed, and the work was reborn in the village. However, he said, Mungidi never returned to the word of God with all my days in the Congo but continue to follow the ways of his people, looking for a son to feed his spirit after death. So instead of inquiring of God, he consulted with mediums and spirits and spirits of divination, and he paid the price. He said, but I learned firsthand the power of spirits, even against the believer sometime. He consulted the dead on behalf of the living instead of going to God's word. He looked to those who have no light in them, the ones who will ultimately be thrown, cast into outer darkness forever. And this guy said, I learned three things in that encounter, that kingdom in conflict. Number one, 
You never invade the devil's turf without clear orders from the Lord. You be presumptuous, you'll get your head handed to you. Number two, move out of the enemy's territory when the battle is beyond us. <laughs> In other words, live to fight another day. And number three, it never pays to underestimate the power of the opposition. Want to hear about principalities and powers? That's real life. <clears throat> so forget about the Hollywood stuff. This is the stuff that goes on all over the world all the time. All right, let's continue on now. We're talking about uh, the whole armor of God. And by the way, if that account doesn't shake you up to let you know that we need this whole armor of God, man, clean out your ears. This was a preacher. This was a lifelong dedicated missionary who was getting his head handed to him. All right, so Paul talks about the fact that we need the whole armor of God. And we've covered two or three pieces of the armor. Ephesians 6, verse 14, Paul said, Having girded your waist with truth, we talked about the, the belt of truth. Then he said the breastplate of righteousness, and we covered the, uh, what it means on Thursday night. If you missed Thursday night, please get to this past Thursday night CD. We described in length what it means, not only in description, but application concerning the breastplate of righteousness. Let's go to the third piece now. And the third piece, as Paul said, is having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, Paul's saying, put on the right shoes and get ready for the march. Get ready for the battle. But you need to put on the proper shoes. You can't wear your high heels and expect to fight in a fight. That's what Paul's trying to say. You've got to be prepared for movement. You've got to be prepared for battle. Sometimes you've got to be prepared for retreat. <clears throat> Sometimes wisdom will get you through to fight another day. Now, here's the point Paul was making. Marching was an essential and normal part of the Roman soldier's life. No soldier, and they would, they would march for miles and miles and miles. No soldier could ever march without sturdy shoes. And so even before the Roman era uh, dawned upon the earth, the breaking of a shoe was a metaphor for weakness or defeat. If you said, oh, that soldier's shoe's broken, his means his spirit was broken and he was no longer a warrior. So it was critical that you wore the right shoes for the right events. Now, the Romans had a shoe. Do we have the shoe up there? Yeah, there we go. They were fashioned from thick leather and they were studded through the soles on the bottom with little nails so they would be able to grip and go through all kinds of terrain. The studded soles enabled a soldier to not only not lose his footing, but listen to this, but stand firm when engaged in battle. I want you to think about the applications here. Not only did he not lose his footing going, uh, traversing various kinds of terrain, but he would be able to stand firm when that was called for. When out his shoes, that Roman soldier could not maintain his position against an enemy. Now, when we talk about the fact that where Paul said, you know, the preparation of the gospel of peace, in the Greek it really means this, to stand with a prepared foundation. How many of you have a prepared foundation in your life? You're not looking to prepare in the heat of the battle, are you? You better have a prepared foundation or you will not be able to stand. Your feet will slip and you will go down. The gospel of peace, Paul said, having your feet shod with the preparation. That means having, standing on a firm foundation to do business with everything that concerns living out the gospel of peace. Sometimes that involves battle. Sometimes it involves standing. Sometimes it involves advancing. Sometimes it involves retreating. Sometimes it involves waiting and holding your ground. 
But you've got to be have a, a firm and prepared foundation in your life. Let me tell you something. You cannot live on yesterday's training. You say, well, I used to be a soldier 25 years ago. Good. What does that have to do with now? See, now you're out of shape, you're older, you're tired, and you're rusty. <laughs> if you're not thoroughly depressed yet, I'll keep going. All right, no. <laughs> See? Your brain writes checks your body can't keep then. So, So when we're talking about living in the gospel of peace, it involves a whole lot of things. It might involve sharing the gospel one day, and it might involve an experience like that missionary had the next day. You don't know what life's going to bring you. You don't know how the Holy Spirit wants to use you and what he will bring you into. You don't know the resistance of the enemy and what he will do to try and stop you, listen, and distract you and waylay you from God's purposes. I'm convinced after many, many years of serving the Lord that one of the greatest tools of the devil besides discouragement and depression is distraction. Amen. He comes into our life and he floats what appears to be legitimate, not evil things. And if he gets us to bite into those one after the other, one after the other, we're going to find ourselves taking care of all the distractions and losing all of our forward movement. I'll give you an example. I can't, I have lost track of the amount of times that this, something like this has happened. Uh, we're going to have a special service. We you know some, some special powerful thing and, you know, and, and everyone commits to coming that particular day. And then that day, one of the key people maybe gets a phone call from an old long lost relative. <laughs> maybe they should have stayed lost in some cases, but... They, you know, they got found. And they said, well, you know, we had this fight uh, 20 years ago. We haven't spoken since. And I'm in town uh, tomorrow for one day. And if you're going to meet, it's got to be, you know, in the morning. On a Sunday morning. You say, well, I got church. Well, then there'll be no meeting. You see what I'm saying? Now, why wouldn't you want to try and make peace with an old adversary? Well, but you have to understand that sometimes, everybody say sometimes. Sometimes those are nothing but distractions that come in the form of something that looks so legitimate. But how could I say no? Because sometimes you have to. You have to discern where that's coming from. I have lost track of the hundreds of times over the years. If unsaved family members are going to have an event, a party, uh, some kind of, well, what's it called? Infant baptism or some other thing. Bridal shower, baby shower, I don't care what it is. Guess when it'll be? When there's something going on in the house of the Lord. Well, we can't come till after. Well, then don't bother coming. I can't believe it. I just can't believe that you won't come for them. Didn't say we wouldn't come. Said we'll see you right after the service. You're gagging and foaming at the mouth on the other end of the phone. But sometimes you got to hold your ground because you understand that sometimes unsaved people can be manipulated by a spirit to plan something at a time where you had something spiritual planned purposely to pull you out of the center and distract you with something as foolish as that. In reference, when you, you know, as compared with God's word. And then when you say, well, I'll come right after the service, and there's still this antagonism. Well, guess what? There's a spirit behind it. When there's not, they'll say, yeah, fine, come right after the service. We, we already will have started. Is that all right? Yeah, no problem. Just save me a few plates of food. <laughs> save me some ribs. <laughs> no. All I'm saying is you've got to discern the spirit, one of the gifts of the Spirit, according to 1 Corinthians 12, is discerning of spirits. Now, that's just not saying, gee, is there an angel in the room? Come on, man. Yeah, and there's feathers falling, and there's gold dust. 
Gold dust and there's gold filling. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, now, let's get all that out of the way. Let's get to real life. Discerning the spirit of a matter, the situation, discerning the spirit that's moving through a person is where discerning of spirits really, really comes into play on a daily operational basis. Discerning whether there's a demon there <coughs> or potentially an angel there, does it happen? Of course it happens. But certainly with the angelic part of it, nowhere near with the frequency of, of discerning other situations that are not of the Spirit of God. Those things happen a lot more frequently. I mean, how do you ever really know when an angel's in your room? I don't want to ask certain Christians because every day they pop, the angels pop in and out of their room, you know. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> well, the last people that I heard doing that actually started getting messages from angels. And it destroyed their life. And it destroyed their church and it destroyed their family. Because nowhere in the scriptures are we told that you get multiple messages from angels no, listen, why do you have the Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside of you? And why is he getting, you know, when angels were used, they were used one time, and in almost every case, the person tried to worship the angel. The angel said, no, 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 get up. You don't worship me. And the angel does this. You don't find angels giving repeated messages, giving their names, their email addresses. That's nonsense. I hope that didn't just blow you. I hope it didn't turn over your theological apple cart there. <laughs> but I don't want you to get sucked, to, sucked into this stuff. Am I saying it never happens? I'm not saying it never happens. But you've got to be very, very careful with extra biblical experiences. <clears throat> or you just get flat out weird. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the Lord wants us to be able to move in all the dimensions of the gospel of peace and all that it involves. Now, I want to read for you. <clears throat> Let me just read a couple of scriptures very, very quickly out of the Psalms. I'm just going to skip right through. Just to give you a quick taste of uh, the importance of what the Bible has to say about feet and shoes. <clears throat> in Psalm 8, verse 6, speaking of the Lord giving to Jesus said, you've given Jesus, um, and uh, oh, I'm sorry, in this case, it's mankind. You have given mankind to have dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things where? Under his feet. Psalm 18 says this, <clears throat> verse 36. It says, you enlarged my path under me so that my feet did not slip. Psalm 40 doesn't it sound good? The Lord enlarges our footsteps. Psalm 40 and verse 2 says, He brought me, the Lord brought me out of a horrible pit of sin, out of the miry clay of this world, and He has set my feet upon a rock. Right? You don't stand on your head, you've got to stand on your feet. Psalm 116. In verse 8 says it this way, you have delivered my soul from death, you have delivered my eyes from tears, and you delivered my feet from falling. Isn't that beautiful? A couple more real quickly. Hebrews chapter 12, in verse 13. All well, reading verse 12. Hebrews 12, 12, and 13. Therefore, strengthen the hands that hang down and strengthen your feeble knees. Remember we talked about preparing your foundation? Strengthen the hands that hang down. Do you worship? Do you come to worship? When you come to church, if you're feeling down and you're having a bad day, listen, one of the greatest antidotes to that is get your hands up and worship. It sets you free from you. Some people need to be delivered from sin, from drugs, from booze, or some from themselves. You know, you should pray that sometime. Lord, deliver me from me. Because if he delivers you from you, the only one you're going to have is him. 
And what dogs you today will lose its grip. Strengthen the hands that hang down. Strengthen your feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame today might not be dislocated, but rather get healed. See, some, some of you, your walk's a little cockeyed and crooked and you can't commit to a straight, consistent walk because you will not, you refuse to prepare your foundation upon which you stand and make a straight path for your feet. If you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you've always gotten. And if that's not going to be good enough for the Lord, it should never be good enough for us. Because he, one day he's going to tap you on the shoulder and say, I've been trying to get my hand on you for how long? And you refused my hand, so now I'm removing my hand and I won't bother you anymore. You don't want that day to come. Romans 16 and verse 20 says that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Now, I want to finish with this. Out of James chapter 3, when we talk about preparation of the gospel of peace, we're talking about preparing our foundation, making our path straight, doing all the things and living in the dimensions that the gospel represents in our lives. You know that one of the things that should mark our lives is wisdom. I didn't say, it's not about intellect and it's not about perfection, but wisdom will, the Bible says in Proverbs, will guard our lives and it will be like a graceful ornament around our neck and it will keep us in the right path. So I'm going to read James chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. James chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. But I'm going to read it from the J.B. Phillips translation, so it won't stack up here. But if we get it up there on the screen, you can, you can parallel it. This is being more of a modern language translation. James 3, 13 says this. Is there some wise and understanding man among you? Question. And everybody just starts going... Yeah, me, me, me. And the writer of, uh, I'm sorry, James says it this way. Okay, then let's examine. Then let that person's life, if that person's claiming to have wisdom, then let that person's life be a shining example of the humility that is born of true wisdom. But if your heart is full of bitter jealousy, a spirit of rivalry, then do not boast that you have wisdom, and in doing so, deny the truth. You may acquire a certain wisdom to be sure, but not all wisdom comes from above. It comes from this world potentially. It can even come from your lower nature. It can even come from the devil. For wherever you find jealousy, rivalry, dissension, etc., you'll also find disharmony and all other sorts of evil will come out of a place of disharmony. You hear that? All kinds of other evil will come out of a place where we allow disharmony to enter. It's a track trick of the devil. The wisdom that comes from above is pure, peace-loving, gentle, approachable, full of merciful thoughts and kindly actions, straightforward, with no hint of hypocrisy to it. And the peacemakers go on quietly sowing for a harvest of righteousness. Is that a beautiful depiction of what it really means to have the wisdom of God? And let me leave you with this thought. Wherever we walk, we should seek to be peacemakers. Wherever we walk, we should strive and seek to be peacemakers. That means you don't take sides in a matter. Try and be a peacemaker in a matter. To the best of your ability, have a spirit of peace marking your life because that's really a demonstration of godly wisdom. Okay, let's stand, everybody. <clears throat>